Well, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, this is, as you know, our uh, annual session we have uh, every year with uh, LASS Day. And our session, of course, is on art and archaeology. And these are primarily uh, our finest students who are doing research and uh, papers on specific topics related to art and archaeology, of course. And uh, this time we have quite a variety. Even though the description sounds like primarily it was Bronze Age Greece, I'm not sure how it got in there, we have other things as well. So there'll be papers on Tibet, uh, Japanese art, uh, and a host of other topics. So we're going to start today with uh, our first topic, which is about ancient Greece. And Holly Bostic is going to be uh, the, our first presenter, and she's going to be dealing with the Antikythera mechanism and the mystery of that from ancient Greece. So Holly? Good afternoon, everyone. So this last summer, I was fortunate enough to get to go with the short-term study abroad to Greece. And while we were in Athens at the National Archaeological Museum, um, on special exhibit, they had a special on the antique theorem mechanism, and they actually had the mechanism there. And so when I returned, I decided to write my research paper on that, finding it very intriguing. Um, I did bring a pamphlet from the museum. I'm going to pass it around. You guys can check it out while I'm talking. Just All right. So first, to get oriented on where we are, um, Antiki Thera is a small island off of Crete, as you can see, in the Greek Isles. Um, this is where the shipwreck was discovered that housed the mechanism and the other treasures that I'm going to be discussing. So the shipwreck was discovered in 1901. Like most of the world's greatest discoveries, it was actually made on accident. Some sponge divers um, on the island, they were going down and one of them returned to the surface saying that there was a catastrophic um, like battlefield under the water, that there were horses and bodies and decaying corpses and all just like creeping out of the sand. And um, the captain of the sponge diving team thought that the man had just had a lot, lack of oxygen and uh, went down himself and came back with a bronze arm. So after that, um, they went down and returned with as many artifacts as they could. Uh, underwater archaeology wasn't really a thing at the time. They didn't have any scuba gear, so they just recovered what they could for the time being. So this, is, this was actually um, a replica from the museum, what it would have looked like underwater when they went down. You can see part of um, the horse's body down there. So um, there's a lot of mystery surrounding the shipwreck. We have a lot of... Uh, articles like this, the uh, amphora and Greek vases that were recovered. Um, it's very mysterious because scholars don't know where the ship was going or exactly that nobody knows the name of the ship and hasn't been documented that way. Um, they have uh, deciphered that it is a Roman ship, however, um, and they think that it was returning to Rome with the plunders from ancient Greece, uh, maybe even for Julius Caesar. Um, the ship has been dated to approximately 86 BC. Um, and they've actually been able to carbon date the elm that the ship was made for, which was used predominantly in Roman ships. Um, they believe that it was, uh, the dating of the wood is actually 220 BC, but they said that the gap in time um, makes sense considering the age that the tree would have been when it was chopped down to be used for the ship. Um, so as far as the contents, before we get into the mechanism, because they are also quite amazing, some of the marbles that were recovered, um, the treasures, they're absolutely incredible. They have been deteriorated by the salt from sitting on the bottom of the ocean floor. But um, so you can understand why the sponge divers would have been shocked finding bodies like this. They do look a bit like corpses. But um, as you can see, the amazing Greek work and the experimental stances like the crouching boy and the contrapposto, which is the shift in um, weight on the legs of this uh, marble we see here. And then some <coughs> of the truly amazing discoveries are the intact bronzes that were found in the shipwreck. So you see that this is the um, philosopher's head over on the right, which I always think looks a bit like Poseidon, how I would think he was sculpted. And then this figure is Perseus, and they believe that his hand would have been holding the head of Medusa in the original, which of course was lost. But um, it's very rare to find Greek bronzes. Most of the marbles that we see in museums are actually Roman copies of the Greek bronze originals. So these are really amazing finds. And especially you can see the ivory eyes are still intact. Most of the times in museums, if we have the bronzes, they're usually hollow. 
but um, <coughs> most of the bronzes in Greece were melted down at a certain point for the wars, so really amazing finds. Um, part of why the Antiki Theory shipwreck is so famous is because um, you have names tied to it, like Jacques Cousteau, who returned <coughs> in the 70s um, to, find, to retrieve the remaining artifacts, and he was really one of the fathers of uh, underwater archaeology, so again, um, just adding to the intrigue and the, um, the how special the shipwreck is. So that leads us into the mechanism itself. Um, it was actually recovered in 1901 when the initial sponge divers went down, but it was m several years later when the archaeologists were sifting through the material, trying to put together the amphora and the pottery and um, analyzing the ceramics, that they actually uncovered the pieces of the mechanism. Um, it was, it first came across, it was just a piece of corroded bronze, and what was so intriguing was that it had the gear embedded into it, which was very strange for the time period. Um, there aren't other artifacts like this, it's really um, singular in that um, fact. Um, so, there are seven large fragments and about 75 other minor pieces, and about 36 other missing pieces. Um, as of 2013, divers have returned to the site and they are still recovering these bits of bronze. But um, basically, it is the world's first analog computer. Um, it is an astrolabe, so it maps the stars and the cosmos and keeps up with calendric cycles and moon cycles and um, maps the constellations, the cosmos. Um, there are inscriptions around the outer rim uh, in ancient Greek that are astronomical indicators, um, and most importantly, it was portable, which is absolutely <coughs> incredible for the time. So, according to the Archaeological Museum, it displayed the positions of the Sun and Moon and most probably the five planets known to antiquity, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. It was used to predict solar and lunar eclipses. It kept an accurate calendar of many years and displayed the dates of the Panhellenic Games that took place at Nimea, at Isthmia, at Delphi, at Dodona, and at Olympia. So we have to understand at this time period, with the sky so bright, no pollution, that the Greeks were trying to find a way to explain all the happenings of the world, you know, the movements of the cosmos, and this was a way that they could explain it. Um, like you can see here, Atlas holding the world, holding up the, uh, in the mechanism itself, the astrolabe charting the skies. So, um, a lot of people were very skeptical. They thought, well, it could be an astrolabe, but really that's just speculation. So um, physicists were brought in and did radiographs and made three-dimensional models confirming that it is an instrument for um, navigation and thusly an astrolabe. It has been dated to do with the second half of the second century BCE or the late Hellenic period. Um, and as of today, 3D models and complete reconstructions have been made. So we do know what it was like, about how big it is. It's approximately this size and obviously portable. Again, why it's so famous and why it's such a big discovery. So what is it about the Antiki Theory mechanism that makes it such a mystery and makes it so important to history and to art history? And why would we, hundreds of years later, still be returning to the site in 2013 to recover the missing pieces and try to find anything? Um, and I think that what it is is that <coughs> the discovery of the mechanism completely altered our perceptions of the ancient world. It made us redefine modernity, redefine what the human mind does. Um, as far as the sciences, histories, uh, just made everyone rethink the ancient world completely. It overturned our notions of what ancient Greek society was capable of, and in, once we know that, then we have to rethink what Egyptian society and Sumerian societies were capable of. And that is the mystery of the mechanism. And knowing that there's still parts missing, there could be replicas, there could be duplicates. Um, I think that's why we keep returning to the site. So any questions, comments? Okay. So this is the only one they've found. They haven't found the other. This is the only one they've found so far. But that's why in 2013, cool. they're still diving, looking for. And the missing 36 pieces that they think still belong to it. So, mm -hmm. They think that they had, the Romans had been plundering Greece for the sake of Julius Caesar, trying to bring the treasures back. 
Um, and there, they are certain that it is a Roman ship. There were coins also <laughs> discovered when Jacques Cousteau went back. So Roman coins and Roman utensils, along with the Greek artifacts. So more than, they don't know how it sunk though, which is part of the mystery. They don't know if it was natural causes, if it was, you know, in some kind of battle. So that's just part of the mystery. So. I was curious uh, with the marbles, half of them like, deteriorated, the other half didn't. Is that possibly because one half was lodged in the sand? Mm -hmm, that's what, yep, exactly. Cool. Some of them, I didn't get pictures of all of them, but some of them were completely deteriorated. And just um, barnacles, I think in the museum, our tour guide, she described it as something like from Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> it looks like it had like crept out of the water. So it was very cool. Anything else? Excellent. Thank you for your time. My presentation is on um, Tibet and the recent events, well, not so recent, but how their art has been affected by the Chinese occupation of Tibet. Um, before I can really get into their art, I should explain what's happening with China and Tibet. Um, Tibet is one of the, major, the neighboring countries of China, as you can see on the map and it was invaded by China in 1949 under the pretense that um, in ancient times Tibet was actually part of China. And so um, the Communist Party went back in to occupy it as a way of kind of taking it back <coughs> in a sense. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, when the Communist Party invaded and in the years right after that, um, there began a string of human rights violations and religious oppression because um, I'll get into Buddhism a bit later in the next couple of slides, but you have to understand that Tibet was a nonviolent country. They had no militia, they had no weapons because the national religion was Buddhism. So they were committed to compassion and nonviolence. So when a military regime like communism comes in and invades the country, uh, there was significant loss of life and um, just because of the communism ideology of kind of getting rid of the old and moving forward with what they thought was um, the newest system, they eradicated many of the um, more ancient things that we think of when we think of Tibet. Like, uh, there was a lot of religious oppression where the monks were forced to leave the monasteries and many of them are actually destroyed. Um, the, um, you, you can get arrested for just having the picture of the Dalai Lama in your home. Um, and it still continues today. It's gotten actually quite a bit worse, which has prompted many Tibetans to cross over the Himalayas into India where they're given refuge because Buddhism originated in India. So they have one city where the Dalai Lama has made his center now. And um, if Tibetans are lucky enough to escape, many of them move there or they spread out to other countries, which explains why the United States has seen um, a lot more Buddhist influences. Like, for example, Emory has a Tibet program where many of the Tibet's uh, diaspora monks teach as professors and they're helping to spread the word about Tibet. Um, before we can really understand their art and understand why um, and understand why the religious oppression is so terrible, we should understand Buddhism itself first. And like any religion, Buddhism is very complex, so I'm just going to give like the bare basics. And I have some websites 
at the very end if you want to learn more about it. But um, Buddhism originated in India in about 500, 580 BC uh, by Siddhartha Gautama. I, I don't think I pronounced his name correctly. But basically, um, it's an offshoot of Hinduism, where instead of being polytheistic, Buddhism is basically atheistic because it um, really champions the individual's path toward wisdom. Um, the whole premise of Buddhism is that everything is connected, like there's no difference between Hillary and I or Holly and I or Hillary and Hollery, <laughs> Hillary and Holly. <laughs> we're, we're the same, we're just different expressions. And so, um, the, the whole premise of Buddhism is that the student can learn that themselves through um, looking inside themselves, like usually through intense meditation, but uh, in recent years Buddhism has become more open to the individual really finding their own path in Buddhism, kind of like the different sects of Christianity where, you know, um, maybe you're not a Methodist but you're a Baptist and maybe you um, have a certain way that you practice, practice baptism. Um, in Buddhism, recently, um, they've, uh, they still follow the core teachings of the Four Noble Truths, but how you find those Noble Truths is really up to you. Um, and the Noble Truths themselves is kind of what the Buddha originally laid down as the path where it's uh, the student first has to realize that the world <coughs> is suffering, that um, you know you can't just gloss over suffering like a lot of people think Buddhism is. They think it's just you meditate all day and you don't have to focus on the terrible things in the world. Um, Buddhism teaches that you have to realize there is suffering first before you can make any other progress. And then the second truth you can realize is once you've come to terms with there being suffering, you can start to realize that you can um, overcome this suffering, that there is a way out of it, that you're not stuck in it. Which brings you to the third noble truth, which um, you realize that this way to overcome suffering is by um, not becoming like obsessed with your desires, like you obviously can't get rid of desire itself, but you shouldn't hold on to unattainable desires because they think that's the root of all suffering. Um, and then the fourth noble truth is basically, um, they, they call it the Eightfold Path, but essentially for the sake of a condensed presentation, the Eightfold Path is um, having a compassionate mind, um, acting, compassionately, you know, choosing, um, choosing a career that will benefit humanity in some way. Um, one of the more interesting things I found about Buddhism is that even though it's atheistic, um, the very accepting nature of Buddhism has proven it to be iconic, where they do worship icons like, um, like lamas. They have holy figures called lamas and bodhisattvas. And there are also um, an iconic symbols where it's not necessarily a person or a figure, but it's just symbols of the religion itself, which we'll see in the mandalas. Like uh, some of the more common ones are lotuses or bodhi trees, where it's where according to legend, um, Buddha attained his enlightenment under the bodhi tree. Um, the mandalas themselves are a form of iconic and aniconic art because, um, as we'll see, it's often centered around a deity, so it's centered around an icon. But um, there are also aniconic elements in it, like you'll see lotuses, or you'll see um, bodhi trees, or you'll see elephants, which represent the Buddha himself. And the mandala itself, um, it's meant as a meditation tool. Um, this will make more sense when we look at the actual mandalas in a minute. But the student would focus on the very center of the mandala and as they meditate they would 
branch out towards the very edges, and it's seen as a visual path toward enlightenment. Um, this is the first mandala we're going to look at. It's an ancient mandala, and so it was created around 1300 in Tibet. Um, it was created specifically for a mon monastery, so that's why we have this specific deity, uh, Hayagriva. I think I pronounced that wrong, but bear with me. Um, I thought it would be best to start with ancient mandalas and work our way towards modern mandalas, because the ancient mandalas really lay the framework for the organization and the, uh, the structure in the art that's going to change as we see China uh, beginning to occupy Tibet. So in this mandala, um, we can see just the basic framework where the very center right here is the deity that the mandala is uh, centered upon. Um, and then moving outwards, you can see the lotus petals, these rings. And again, the lotus was a very um, important symbol in Buddhism because the lotus itself grows in mud. Like the roots are in mud and it sprouts upward. And so um, in some of my interviews, interviews for this project, I've had some monks tell me that um, the lotus flower symbolizes that the way that the student has to view suffering. Because you have to see, okay, the world is suffering, but I can't become attached to that. You know, even though I grow in mud, I have to let the mud slide off me so I can grow upward like the lotus flower. And so, um, as we'll see in other mandalas, you typically have two or three rings of the lotus flowers with different holy figures within them, like you see some deities and some bodhisattvas, which are enlightened figures similar to the Lama. And then you continue to go outward and you see the palace, these uh, up there. And um, the really interesting thing about these mandalas is that the palace kind of has um, <coughs> two purposes in the mandala. Um, first of all, the four walls represent the four noble truths. But um, secondly, when the, uh, when the student meditates on this mandala, they're supposed to envision themselves sitting with the deity, and they're supposed to envision like a three-dimensional concept of this palace forming around them. So one of the reasons that these ancient mandalas have such an aerial view, like as though you're looking at it from the sky in a, you know, like a bird's eye view, is because it's easier for the student to visualize the to visualize themselves inside the palace if you can see all of the four walls. Like, um, imagine if the mandalas just looked like a room, like a deity sitting with one wall, it would be hard to visualize the walls all around you. And um, we continue to go out, and this is one of the most important structures in the mandala that we'll see, these three rings here. Um, again, we have the lotus flower petals which go around the entire structure. And um, then we have this golden ring. That's the second ring right there next to the symbols. And um, the ring itself demonstrates the importance of compassion in Buddhism, because this ring is the ring of compassion. And so it's kind of seen as, OK, you're inside of the palace. You've got the four noble truths around you so that you can concentrate. You've got the lotus flower to remind you not to hold on to suffering. And then you've got this ring of compassion surrounding you. And then um, the third ring is, it's supposed to be flames, like fire. And so you can see the colors correspond to the rest of the color scheme. But um, the fire itself isn't destructive as we would think of it. It's seen as the fire of wisdom. And it actually is supposed to form like a shield around the temple when you're meditating, like picture like a dome of fire, where um, it's seen as like a shield of wisdom against you know, misguided thought or against ignorance to help the monks concentrate. And um, these, three, the, these three rings are very important because while the more modern mandalas we see um, won't incorporate the rest of these deities or the rest of the structure, they still have these three rings in them. Um, and then you can see four other smaller mandalas in the corners, 
which is pretty typical of ancient mandalas because they're um, usually other deities or other bodhisattvas that the artist thought was most important. And then on the very top line up there, we can see um, a row of lamas and bodhisattvas. And uh, most important is um, the the body structure of these deities, because I know the image is a bit blurry, but if you were to get a better picture of it, you could see that they're actually androgynous, and that relates to an important part of Buddhism where wisdom is seen as combining or finding a middle way in between all the extremes, which is why it's called the middle way. And so they, um, even though most of the lamas were male, they would design them as androgynous as a way of saying that they found a middle way between the extremes of male and female, between that polarity. And then in, on the very bottom, you can see um, a row of goddesses dancing. And this is significant too because the deity in the middle is male, and um, the female deities down here represent the female counterpart, because as the middle way, Buddhism likes to acknowledge both extremes. And so the male deities are almost always accompanied by a female counterpart. Um, this is a more modern mandala painted in the early 2000, between 2000 and 2007. Um, this artist was originally from Tibet. He's um, similar to the way that Tibetans would see their religious figures. He was seen as the next great artist for his generation. Like um, the lamas traditionally would be sought out during childhood and they would um, like uh, they would seek out children in the village if they had special gifts or special talents that the earlier Lama had hinted at. And um, as an artist, this artist was singled out as kind of prophesied as the next great artist who would um, sort of modernize mandalas in a way. Like he was seen as taking Buddhism and creating a new art form with it. And so, um, this mandala is called the Thousand Arms of Compassion, which I thought was um, very uh, important, considering we're talking about the animosity between China and Tibet, that a modern artist would paint something about compassion. It shows that compassion is still a very important part of Buddhism. And um, one of the most apparent things we can see in this mandala is that the structure itself has changed. It's no longer a bird's eye view that we had before. Like, um, we still have a central deity here, but the palace walls, it's more of a three-dimensional structure instead of a flat um, square around the deity. And um, <coughs> I thought it was interesting how he incorporated smaller mandalas as well of the bodhisattvas and the deities, but he used them in a way that showed more depth and more space in the painting, which was previously unheard of in these types of mandalas. Like you can see where this one is in the foreground closest to the viewer, and then this one is in the midground closest to the deity, so it draws you inward. But um, um, some of the ancient things that this artist was holding on to, like the traditions, was a deity, which um, in the next mandala there are no deities. It's completely aniconic. Um, this deity represents compassion because it's sort of an archetypal figure of compassion for Buddhism, like how Christianity sees Jesus as the figure for compassion and love. Um, even though Buddhism is atheist and aniconic, um, this bodhisattva was seen as like the one to refer to for compassion. And um, the reason he has a thousand arms is because in his lifetime, he made it his mission to completely eradicate the suffering of the, all living beings. But according to you know, myth or legend, it was so much, it was such a huge task that he split into a thousand pieces. And so a deity came, and according to myth, they put him back together with a thousand arms. And you can see his arms radiating out, which um, is interesting because in this mandala, 
the deity is the largest part of the mandala, where before we've seen him as a much smaller part. And um, we can see the three rings I've been talking about earlier. They're still present in this mandala. Um, for example, he's standing on a lotus throne instead of the lotus being around him. And we still had the palace structure. And one of the things I thought that was most important was um, the clouds on the very top look very similar to Chinese landscape painting. They're clouds, and so it shows kind of um, a, a readiness to cooperate with the Chinese, which a lot of Buddhist monks want anyway. They don't see it with the same animosity that Americans do. They see it as trying to cooperate instead of trying to eradicate the Chinese and being completely independent. And so by including something similar to Chinese landscape paintings in his modern mandala says quite a lot for um, a Buddhist artist. Um, this is the last mandala we're going to look at. It's a bit blurry, but um, this mandala is pretty significant because it was painted, it was created in 2010 by an artist who studied both Chinese brushwork and a um, ancient, you know, mandala work, ancient Thanka mandala work. And so he has both influences clearly shown in this mandala, where um, in the middle, instead of a deity, we have a clock, which I thought was pretty significant because it shows that uh, in modern life, instead of worshiping a specific deity, uh, we've begun to worship time itself. Like, instead of reaching enlightenment by following the path of a bodhisattva, it's become reaching enlightenment by accomplishing the most that you can in a day, which I think the artist was trying to say here. And then, um, instead of a palace wall, we have an array of stickers in this one um, section. It's a bit blurry, I didn't realize it would be. <laughs> but um, on the original slide, it had some text and some smaller images but really, you couldn't see the individual stickers very much anyway. It was just a conglomeration of color. And I think that shows um, somewhat the impermanence, <coughs> like uh, impermanence instead of the ancient mandalas having big, heavy walls, big, heavy palace walls, where this has you know, tiny stickers. It shows that we're becoming a bit more impermanent and moving a bit away from traditional technique. And then, um, the lotus flower is still incorporated here, which you can see in these tiny little sections of stickers around. And um, I think that's significant that when he chose to abandon most other Buddhist ideology, he kept the lotus flower. You know, he kept the idea that you can't become overly attached to something <coughs> or obsessed about something in the Wheel of Modern Life, which is the name of this. But um, the most significant thing I wanted to talk about for this mandala was with his um, training in Chinese brushwork, he brought a lot of Chinese technique to this mandala. And I know it's a bit hard to see, but there are some slightly darker patches along there that look like um, they might be some type of watercolor. And anyone who studied Chinese landscape painting, this is especially significant because it shows that um, the use of negative space, where the previous mandalas, everything was just full of icons and imagery. And there's some more information about Tibet, if anyone um, wanted to look that up. And there's my works. Thank you. Thanks, and we, our next presenter is uh, Esther Franklin, and she's going to be doing her work on some Japanese art. Hi guys, um, I'm Esther. Thanks for joining me today. Um, this is a topic that I've been uh, interested in for about two years, um, and I have a lot of material to cover in very little time, so um, I'd just like to just jump right into the material. Um, I am going to be talking today about this mask, which is called the Hanya mask, and it is used in Japanese no theater. 
And in stagecraft, this mask is used to portray the archetypal jealous female. Um, according to Toshiro Morita, the expression of this mask is a fusion of jealousy, grudge, sorrow, and grief of women. It has a demonic appearance with two horns, knitting her brows and stiffening her cheeks. Subsequently, uh, Margaret Coldiron, research assistant in the Department of Classics and Ancient History at Durham University, said the following on the mask. The no Hanya mask is dangerous and demonic, yet at the same time tormented and sorrowful. Within her monstrous visit, visage, there is all the complexity of human emotion. The most striking features uh, are the bulging eyes and the fierce fanged mouth. These characteristics are fundamental to the archetypal apotropaic, I can't pronounce that, apotropaic face, which presents an expression that indicates the ambivalent yet highly arresting stage between a laugh and a frown, and, uh, or between fear and aggression. Um, and I wanted to address the name here, the Hanya mask. Um, there's been many issues in the translation of this name into English. Various suggestions when I was doing my research were as follows. Um, she, de she, demon, ogress, ghost, <coughs> or female serpent. However, I for one do not feel like any of these terms are correct or adequate. Um, and that's because the word Hanya is actually the, uh, it was imported to Japan through Buddhist missionaries, and it's a Buddhist word that actually means wisdom. Um, Sanskrit in origin, it's actually pronounced Panya, and it refers to the wisdom that is necessary for one to attain enlightenment. So my question when I came to this topic is, why are we uh, not calling it a wisdom mask? Because that's what it is. Um, so when I was doing my research, I came across a couple of different sources. Um, there are two views about the origin of its name. Uh, Hanya, uh, one, one is that a monk from the Nara Hanya Bo translated the creation of this type of mask into art. Basically what he's saying is, um, I don't know if this is a person or of a location, but they think that there is a person who created it and that's why they just decided to name it after him. Uh, I didn't really feel that was a very strong argument. The other uh, school of thought is that the, the person who is creating the mask of demons, the artist, is required to, uh, the mask maker, I'm sorry, the mask maker is required to have the wisdom which opens people's minds to the reality of things. Um, however, these are not actually the only two schools of thought in existence. There are other scholars like Dr. Cold Iron, who is a scholar on Asian theatrical masks, and she falls into this third camp. And it's that the Hanya Shingyo, sometimes referred to as the Hanya Kyo, which is a Japanese, uh, it's a Buddhist text known as the Wisdom of Perfection Sutra, or sometimes translated as the Heart Sutra, is used in the drama play Aoi no Ue for the, er for the exorcism of Lady Rokujo, one of the most famous roles for which the Hanya mask is used. Um, what Cold Iron is referring to here is um, it's, it's one of the most famous plays for utilizing the Hanya mask, and uh, that play's name is Aoi no Ue. And in my opinion, this is the most logical of all the proposed theories. Um, I have even seen this cited when I was doing research in Japanese dictionaries as, a, uh, as a, a proposal for the origin of its name. So I thought, oh, this seems like it would be pretty likely then. Um, so uh, despite what I believe to be the strongest candidacy, candidacy for the explanation of its origins, there are a few problems with this theory. Um, and so I would like to address these matters. Um, but however, to understand these new issues, it requires a little understanding of what the play is about. So I'm gonna give you the brief Cliff Notes version. Uh, please bear with me. Um, so the play Aoi no Ue is based off of an episode from the Tale of Genji. It comes out of the ninth chapter. Um, I don't know if anyone here has read the Tale of Genji. Maybe you could show me by hand. So maybe you know what I'm gonna be talking about, okay. So it's the world's oldest novel, and it was written by Murasaki Shikibu in the 11th century in Japan. And this was the Heian period, and it was sort of a period that was very influenced by um, Chinese cultural, uh, 
the Chinese cultural past was very influential on the imperial court life in Japan. Um, well, not to get too detailed, um, since we are pressed for time, this, uh, the story follows the escapades of Prince Genji and the lives of the many different women who he becomes romantically involved with, each one of whom experiences various heartache as a result of their relationship with him. Um, so for all purposes of, of this speech, we're just going to be looking at two female characters. And that will be uh, Aoi no Wei, the lady Aoi. And she is Prince Genji's wife. She is the daughter of the minister of the left. And she is very upset by her husband's inconstancy and his philander, philandering. And his, her great pride manifests uh, in sort of an estranged coldness with her relationship with her husband. And so unsatisfied at home, Prince Genji decides to uh, seek out his longtime lover, the Lady Rokujo, to help alleviate his unhappiness. Um, and she's a very high-ranking lady. And after suffering some public humiliation at the hands of Genji's wife, uh, and there was a chariot incident, um, she becomes to, uh, the lover becomes very jealous of the wife. And so jealous, in fact, that she transforms herself into a living, vengeful spirit, which you will see right here. Um, in the no play, Aoi no Wei, it focuses on this particular supernatural struggle between the jealous spirit of Lady Rokujo and the Buddhist clergy, um, who in their efforts attempt to exercise the spirit who is possessing uh, Genji's wife. And this is another uh, ukiyo noe depiction. Um, the play calls for some interesting stage directions. Uh, for one, the Lady Aoi never actually makes an appearance on stage. Instead, a piece of cloth is laid out in the front and the center. And it's supposed to represent the Lady Aoi suffering from an episode of spirit possession without resistance. And it should also be noted that at this time period, she's carrying a child, um, Genji's son. And so a Buddhist priest is called into the household to uh, pacify not only the spirit, but to also ensure a safe delivery of the child. Um, so this is where um, we come back to the Hanya mask. It is said at this time period that Buddhist priests would read the Hanya Shingyo, the, the scripture that I was referring to, the sutra, um, as an exorcism sutra. And, uh, the problem with the theory, of course, is that when you look at the original text, both in the novel and the play, it actually doesn't say that. Um, one second. In the Royal Tyler version of the translation of the book, they refer to the Lotus Sutra, as does uh, many other scholars who I researched. But curiously enough, um, Dennis Washburn, who's just translated a very recent version that's been published in the Norton Anthology, third edition to world literature. He decided to say that um, the word used in his translation was um, the canon chapter of the Lotus Sutra. Like he honed in specifically that they didn't just read this entire Lotus Sutra, which is a very, very long sutra. They focused on the 23rd chapter, which is dedicated to the Bodhisattva of compassion. And I thought that was very interesting. And when I, I sent an email out to him, and this was his reply back, and he said that from historical sources that we know that the priest in an exorcism like this would not have chanted the entire sutra. Um, this was the part of the sutra that was thought to be the most uh, efficacious for childbirth. Um, and it's why temples at Hatsusei and Ishiyama were dedicated to Kanon, um, were particularly important sites for women to go on mm -hmm. pilgrimages. Um, so, um, what I thought was a really fascinating coincidence between the two is that both the Hanya Shingyo and this particular chapter of the Lotus Sutra are actually both dedicated to the same deity in Buddhism. Um, and that is this deity over here, um, Kanon Bolsatsu. She is known maybe more commonly in the West as Guanin. Um, she is Originally, she was conceived in a, in a male, uh, as a male bodhisattva, but when it entered Mahayana tradition, it actually, she became uh, a female because 
of her um, compassionate and sort of motherly traits. And she became almost like the patron saint of children and of mothers. And so it, make, it would make sense that at this time period, people would pray to her to you know, help deliver a safe child. So, um, so she also was known to provide aid in disaster. So my, my proposition is, could these two texts possibly be interchangeable? Um, historically, the Hanya Shinryo, or the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra, was a malleable text with many functional usages. And one um, usage was, indeed, as an exorcism mantra. So perhaps there is uh, merit in the assertion that the Hanya mask can be etymologically attributed to the Hanya Shinryo. Um, and this certainly seems to ring true in later literary adaptations and artistic adaptations. Um, so, to conclude, um, I wanted to give you the, the last line of the no play, when uh, after the Buddhist priest has recited his chants, um, it said, at the sound of the incantation, the demon heart is quelled. In the form of forgiveness, mercy, and compassion, the welcoming bodhisattvas descend, salvation and spiritual release, are received with the deepest gratitude. And I thought that was really interesting that it talks about mercy, forgiveness, mercy, and compassion and bodhisattvas. And I, I would think it's none other than this bodhisattva right here. So. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Our next presentation is uh, both art and ecological. And this is uh, Amanda Crossan. Japanese festival. Hello, I'm Amanda. As he said, I will be presenting on the Japanese Tenbata Festival. <coughs> it dates back to almost 2,000 years ago. It came from a festival in China, and it was brought over in the feudal period to Japan, during which it was combined with local customs and became a event in the imperial court. Soon the other people started to celebrate it and making it their own, and each area of Japan celebrates it a little bit differently. Some people celebrate it on different days. As in Japan, the 15th day, January and July, were thought to be good times, and this is in the lunar calendar, were thought to be good times to, ce to celebrate the gods, which is, as I will get to later, one of the reasons why it's held on the days that it is. All right, we're not going to get to that just yet. <coughs> so there was, back before it became what it is today, there were different rituals in which people would celebrate the gods of rice patties, as during this time in the lunar calendar in the season, which is July, the rice would be start, uh, I don't know if rice blooms or grows or however it's called, the rice would be growing and it would be time for them to harvest. But there were a lot of problems because there would be famine, there would be uh, diseases, and there would be not enough rain. There were a lot of different things that were hindering the growth of the rice, which th was very important to them. It's a huge staple for their diet. So they started doing a lot of prayers to these gods and asking for them to make sure that it would rain, that they would have these, uh, the good harvest. And part of what they did for that is that they would have these certain girls come and weave cloth for the gods. And it, they would come and do this in an area that was thought to once be used by a famous weaver named Tanabata. And that is possibly where the festival got its name from. Now, for the story that's behind the festival, it started with a princess named Orihime who was a weaver and she married a cowherd named Higaboshi. And in some versions that I've read, different versions have different uh, ideas of how they came to be together, but in one that seems pretty common is that the princess was sad because she had spent all of her time weaving and she didn't have any time to fall in love. So her father, who's the emperor of the skies, decided that he would put her with the cowherd who lived across the river. So they became they were married and they became very happy, but they were so in love that they spent all their time together. And she began neglecting her weaving 
and he began neglecting his cow herding. So his, her father then became very angry and decided that they had to be split up again. So he put them on either sides of the river, which for them is called the... I can't remember. It's... I don't remember the name that they had for it, but the river that they were separated by is actually the Milky Way. And Orihime and Hiboshi are represented by the two stars, Vega and Altair. This one up here, I think there's a way I can do a pointer, isn't there? Ah! This, this here is Vega, which is Orihime, and this is Altair. They are the stars that were in love and had to be separated, this being the river. And on one day, and one day only of the year, which is the day that is celebrated, they were allowed to see each other again. So, the, in some stories it's different. In one story I read, it's that the moon actually comes and boats Orihime over to see her love. But if it rains, then the river floods and they can't make it over. So a flock of heavenly magpies come and create a bridge for her to make it. But in order to ensure that th this doesn't happen, that she can indeed make it, they, people will pray for no rain. It's very important. Because without the rain, with the rain, they can't make it, and then the festival doesn't happen, and the rice doesn't grow. So parts of what the festival, ha what happens in the festival in modern times is, first of all, it's call often called the Star Festival, as they were stars, or sometimes Weaver Festival, as it's mainly focused on Orihime. It takes place during the seventh day of the seventh month. As was stated before, that was a good time, because the seventh day is when they would start to prepare for the rituals on the 15th day, as stated before, were good days to worship the gods. So the thing is that it was, I mentioned it was during the lunar calendar. Well, now that we have it differently, it sometimes translates to, instead of being in July, being in August. So some places still celebrate it in August and some places celebrate it in July. But most of, most of the time, they're, how they celebrate it is still relatively the same. It's just at different times. And those who celebrate in August generally celebrate it along with the Festival of Bonn, which is when the ancestors were thought to come back and they would celebrate them and worship them, thank them. And what they would do is that they would write uh, wishes on pieces of cloth and tie them to bamboo. Now, in one of the rituals that it's thought to come from originally, people would tie, it was one of, it was a festival of the five seasons. So people would tie five colorful ribbons to bamboo sticks and they would uh, pray for good skills and which were often, one of those skills would be weaving or technical skills like that as it came from Orihime. And from that we get the fact that now people write their wishes on pieces of paper, often very colorful, and tie them to bamboo sticks for, which are specially erected for this purpose. Now the cloth also represents the cloth which was used uh, to make the clothes that they offer to the gods back in the original rituals. And Oftentimes, now this is interesting, oh, I have a picture afterwards, I thought I had it now, but there are different places, specifically in Sendai and Hiratsuka, which are, have very famous, very large uh, festivals, and they will have their arcades in different areas, will have sort of competitions to see who can have the biggest and brightest and best decorations, and they'll put their decorations up in front of the arcades and see who can have the best. And it just makes everything very colorful and very bright, and the whole uh, streets and everything will be filled with streamers, and it's beautiful. And <coughs> on the next morning, they'll take the pieces that they wrote the wishes on and throw them in the river. And this is related to the custom of let's see, yeah, floating paper lanterns, which is from the Obon, which is another festival which is thought to have some of the origins of the Tanabata festival. And there's also the streamers that are often hung in the streets, which you'll see a picture of them soon. They're very large, and they have large, round sections above them from which the streamers 
come. And those are representing the cloth which, the strings which Orhime used in her weaving. And here you can see these are the colorful paper balls that are put above them. And these are the streamers, the long streamers, and they're all very colorful. And you see the people down here, so just think about how large those actually are. That's, <coughs> that is uh, how they, they compete with quite, quite large, and it gets very, very like, busy and full of color, and it's just everywhere. And here's another one. This is from the Hratska. Uh, one which is also one of the most popular and biggest ones there and they both are ones that have the competitions between so that's why you see such huge uh, decorations everywhere and these are the citations and that's it thank you Amanda our final uh, presentation is by Hillary Coles and uh, she will let you know what she's going to be talking so when I was in high school many years ago, uh, my grand goal was that I was going to drop out and play guitar in a rock and roll band. <laughs> which was pretty naive and it horrified my parents, as you can imagine. So when I finally told them that I was gonna study art in college, they were thrilled, elated. Unfortunately though, many parents are not thrilled when they find out that their son or daughter wants to pursue an art degree. This is probably because art perennially tops the list of worst college majors. You can Google this and see exactly what I'm talking about. Time, Forbes, Yahoo, countless other online publications all slam art as being probably the worst decision you could make. They manipulate us into thinking that art grads are more than likely going to end up sleeping on their parents' couches and living a life of utter poverty. But I don't really buy into this starving artist stereotype and what I want to impress upon you today is that it's just not true. In November of last year, the Wall Street Journal published an article that really painted a more optimistic picture. Artists are very resilient, they're resourceful, and we're finding that they are incredibly satisfied in their careers. You see, while artists are learning the traditional techniques of painting and drawing, printmaking, photography, they're also learning very, very valuable traits that help make them very competitive in the job market. They think independently, they collaborate with others, they handle constructive criticism, they develop very creative solutions to complex problems, and ultimately they learn how to think outside of the box. These are all things that you can apply to countless fields besides art. The article also noticed that the unemployment rate is actually pretty low. It's four and a half percent for those that are graduated longer than two years. Um, and the salaries are also very similar to other liberal arts majors. So a graphic designer annually on average makes about 55,000. Art directors make 96,000 on average. So um, what type of career might an artist pursue after college? I think here it's important to note that the term artist can be a little bit vague and unintentionally misleading. So when I tell people I'm an artist, this is what they think I do. <laughs> I do paint, not this well. This is the creation of Adam from Michelangelo. Um, this isn't exactly what I do to make a living. <laughs> I work as a graphic designer, which means that I take things like shapes and colors, typography and photography, and I combine them to tell stories visually. And it's really, really incredible what you can do with visual storytelling. Um, by now, I'm sure a lot of you have heard that we process visuals 60,000 times faster than text. Rather than explaining this to you, I want to show this to you. Just take a minute and I want you to look at both of these. They mean the exact same thing. I can guarantee you that one of them you're gonna process much quicker than the other. So we consume imagery on a very immense scale every single day from the moment you wake up to the time you go to sleep. And I think because of this, we tend to take it for granted. At times, 
We depend on it to know where we are going, what we are doing, what we maybe shouldn't be doing. We depend on it. Now, I really want you guys to just take a moment and I want you to look at your surroundings. The building we're in was designed by an architect. The clothes you are wearing, the mobile devices in our pockets, the modes of transportation we use to get here, they're all the product of a creative mind, of somebody who probably studied art in college. So design and art, it's more than just the practical things in our everyday lives. Imagery has an intense power over us because it triggers a deep emotional response. Because of this, we're very susceptible to persuasion and propaganda, which isn't always negative. The smartest leaders in history have used visual persuasion to their highest advantage. Alexander the Great's empire was so vast that he needed to find a way to exert his authority in distant lands and disparate cultures. What he did, we've used since. He put his likeness on currency. He made his power and authority tangible, and he placed it in the hands of people who would never lay eyes on him. Elizabeth I of England was another ruler who used portraiture to her advantage. Like Alexander the Great, most of her subjects would never see her in the flesh. Therefore, she commissioned portraits that made her appear perpetually young, vibrant, and healthy. This portrait here is the rainbow portrait. This was painted in 1600. This is three years before she died, so she would have been about 67. If this is the face of a 67-year-old, I, I would love to know what her secret is. <laughs> she looks like she's in her 30s. Um, <laughs> so she knew that controlling the image that she presented her subjects was incredibly important to, enduring, to the enduring stability of her reign. Alexander the Great and Elizabeth I really understood the power that imagery has over us. You see, it's a universal language. It knows no cultural or language barriers. You can use imagery to communicate to everyone. And so for that reason, art is really an inseparable part of our everyday lives and our culture. It is what informs and defines us. So the last thing I really wanted to leave you with is from the 1948 Winter Catalog from Oglethorpe University. Philip Weltner would have been president then. He's who the library is named after. And fine arts was a really important part of their curriculum as it is today. The men and women of creative genius in the several fields of art have been men and women of special intuitional powers. Through their masterpieces, they have communicated to us experiences which deepen our understanding of human life in relation to the universe in which it is lived. The study of art is not an educational luxury, but an activity which gives emphatic expression to that which makes all life worthwhile. The arts are media through which may be revealed passion, inspiration, imagery, and reality too great, subtle, or spiritual to be translated into any other form. Art is one of the most important factors in the educative process. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, feel free to uh, talk to presenters if you're interested in any of their research and their papers. Thanks so much for coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs>